Welcome everybody, my name is Jared Redford. I'm the music and arts director over at ELA. I'm here this year. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the music event, Riff and Hook. Um, today we have three performances going on for you guys. We've got the Native Dance Group performing. we got uh, a couple others. And uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, if you guys would be awesome in the silence and uh, silence your cell phones, would be much appreciated. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Um, we have a uh, main dance group coming up, and I hope you all enjoy.
All right, thank you, Nathan. That's group. What do you guys think?
Um, it was in 2013, and in some places in Galena, the water was up to nine feet high. Like the Yukon River just decided to make Galena its home and covered us in water. Well, why does that song remind me of the flood? Um, there was a team from the Bahamas that came to Galena to help us two different years in a row. And one of them brought that hymn, a really old hymn, made it into his own and taught it to us, to us here in Galena. So it's close to my heart. And that flood uh, it, and the river seem to be really good inspirations for me because you'll hear in this next song uh, little hints of the Yukon. It's not about the Yukon, but it inspired this new song. And I think right now the title is Holding On.
Thank you. That was the world's debut here in Galena for you guys. <laughs> All right. So this last song before the amazing duo uh, comes takes the stage is um, is one that talks about struggles. Kids, you know, like growing up, I felt like everyone else's lives must be perfect, and when things were tough in my life, I was the only one. But that's not true. We all have some really rough times, but um, most, most of the time we don't have to stay and live in those dark times in our life. So this one is acknowledging the hard seasons that we go through, but also acknowledging the light that we can find if we keep putting one step in front of the other. This song is Climbing. So much loss So many tears I can't see The forest for all my fears When you
You guys are great. I'm excited for you all to hear them. Chamai in uh, Bethel, the dance festival. I'm telling you, you dancers would have slayed them there. That was so good. That was really, really good. Jeff and I were standing back there. Our faces were just feel proud when you hear that. It's really, really good. Really good. And Carrie, holy oh, smokes! What a voice! Wow, Power, powerful stuff. It really is. So it's a small crowd, so this is really, really informal, so if you want to talk to us, you can. It's not like a regular show. <laughs> Big thank you to Jared and Therese and um, everybody that made this possible. We're really, really happy to be in your community. There's nowhere I'd rather be right now. I'm, I'm a super lucky guy, and I've got to play in some really fancy places in my life. And um, about 19 years ago, I realized that, um, you know, flying to Japan for a day and back again wasn't the point. Um, it was being in places like this where, where you let us experience your culture, and you include us, and we learn so much. Man, this is so powerful. You live in such an incredible community, um, and I, I'm I'm married. I've been married 31 years. I have a son, Colin, who's 24, and this is the kind of thing I want to take back and tell my son and my family about. Not those fancy shows that I play. It's it's this stuff. It's really really cool. It really is, and uh, and we're super grateful to be here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna play you um, to start out. I'm gonna play you a tune that. It's by one of my heroes. I've been lucky enough to play the Grand Old Opry in Nashville, I guess, close to 400 times over the years. And um, we shared a dressing room with Bill Monroe and Roy Acuff. They were, uh, Bill Monroe is the father of bluegrass music. That's banjos and fiddles and all that. And Roy Acuff was the king of country music. So they're both really heavy, heavy, heavy players. And I'd always get them to tell me a story about this one musician named DeFord Bailey. And no one knows who he is, and yet he was one of the most influential musicians. He, he changed history, and the reason no one knows about him is because he was black, and it was, uh, it was in the 30s, the late 20s, and the 30s. And um, Bill Monroe said that when he wanted to draw a crowd at his show, he'd bring DeFord Bailey with him, because when he played, the people would come out. But at the end of the show, DeFord would have to sleep on the ground while the rest of the band went in and had a hot meal and, and slept in a hotel room. Even though he was this big star, you know, it's just because his color was different than everybody else. And uh, he put up with that for a long, long time, eventually quit the Grand Old Opry and went back to work at a shoeshine stand. So um, I really love the guy and, and uh, I want to play you a song that if you were listening to the Grand Old Opry, way back when and dial on your radio and through the static. This is the very first thing that you'd hear as the Grand Ole Opry started. It's an instrumental called the Pan American. Oh, 
thanks to all the harmonica players that came out today. I think we had close to 30 people in the, uh, the lesson that we gave. It was awesome, really good, really quick learners. And um, this is Jeff Getty. And uh, we're from near Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, is where we live. And uh, maybe we should play the very first bluegrass tune that I wrote, one called uh, Watermelon Pie. Sound good? Guys are so quiet. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we don't scare you. That's what I was worried about. Another one I wrote with a fellow named Matt Anderson. Uh, it's a, a tune called The Mountain. Feel free to talk to us. It's not often we play shows where we can see everybody. This is actually great, I and mean, we love it. Or throw things if you don't like it. <laughs> <coughs> Big breath, here we go. Ready?
synesthesia. So there's always music going through my head. My son has the same thing. So when I look at you guys, I could actually play a melody based on what the front row is and you and the spaces and it has a time signature and everything is a tone. So um, when Jeff plays a chord on a guitar, if you see, if you notice, I'm, I'm not looking at you, but I'm looking somewhere up there. It's because I'm seeing a color right here. And when he plays a chord, I see a circle with sort of the tonal center, and Carrie, you'll know what I mean, and circles around it that are the other notes of that chord. And I was born that way, and I thought everybody heard music that way, but, but they don't. And uh, what it meant was, all through school, all I did was look out the window. I never paid attention, I never brought a book home, I, I was just always really distracted. But the good part about that was that it allowed me to, to play music because there's always melodies in my head. And the way I play, there's no rules, no musical rules. It's all colors. And uh, so when I quit school, like a dummy, um, I went to work for the uh, roads department when I was, I just turned 17. And I was driving a dump truck, a big dump truck. And I thought I was the coolest person in the world. You know, 17 years old, driving a big dump truck, you know. And, and one of the jobs was um, the road had washed in on Lake Huron. So I had to fill the truck up with big boulders and back right up to the edge of the lake. And it was like a 30 foot drop. And I had to raise the, the box on the truck and, and drop these big boulders in to kind of shore up the road. And uh, on this one particular day, the lake was wild, massive waves. It was going crazy. and. Uh, I was backing the truck up and I hadn't done it very many times and I had the radio cranked, I always have that cranked. And I'm getting really close to the edge of the lake and just as I got there, this song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald about a shipwreck came on and I thought for sure I was going over, but uh, it never happened. So maybe we'll play that one for you.
think it's time for a fiddle tune. Let's see. Maybe a French Canadian fiddle tune, because it's where we're from. This one's called Grumbling Old Man, Grumbling Old Woman. So I don't know if there's any grumbling old men or grumbling old women here. I don't think so. I can see the faces. Any questions? No? What's that? Oh boy. That'll tell you how old I am. I've played 55 years. Holy smokes, you can still stand. <laughs> yeah, yeah long, I played since I was a little kid. No one in my family played any music, but um, there was a harmonica in the house, and I picked it up one day, and I instantly made a sound that made me feel good. And um, that's still the reason I play today. It just feels so good to play. And uh, it's not about the money or the awards or any of that junk. It just feels so good to play. So it's like the fountain of youth. I can still feel exactly like that five-year-old kid, even though I'm 60 years old. And, and not many people get to do that. So I'm really super grateful. So yeah, a long time. Yeah? Uh, did you study music? No. No, no, not at all. Because I think I think about it too weird. Um, for me, it, it, it is all colors and shapes. Like every, when I play, that's what I see. And when I see a color, I can look at a. For instance, when we were flying in here, I can see the mountains off. And when I when I'm looking at a, a ridge line, I'm thinking of a melody, and I'm thinking the time signature fits with the difference, the gap between the mountains and the color and how some are closer and farther. That's just how my brain's wired. So I think if I um, took real music classes, they'd kick me out pretty quickly. <laughs> but, but really, I think that's what music was originally. I mean, um, people played music because they felt something and they wanted to try and explain it. And I think notation and all that stuff was just so that you could show somebody else how to do it. You know, but I think the, the, the original thing is it's all about feel and, and sharing that. So, uh, yeah, we'll play a tune called Grumbling Old Man, Grumbling Old Woman. And this one is all inhaling notes, so you'll see me swallow up like a big balloon. And I've had seven hernias from playing, so I'm warning the front row right now. So, a hernia is when you build up so much pressure in your stomach that this is gross, okay, I'm warning you. Your intestine <laughs> pokes out through your stomach wall. It has to be pushed in and sewed up. So I'm sewed up with stainless steel wire on both sides. So nothing's going to blow. You're going to be okay. <laughs> Pretty gross, I know.
barking up there. <laughs> now we'll uh, we'll play a blues tune. This is one I wrote with a fellow named Matt Anderson, and uh, and it's a tune that a lot of people are recording right now. So it should make me enough money to buy a new refrigerator someday, hopefully. questions by the way. It makes me feel at home and it's not a gig. I see two. All right, first here. Um, how many times have you traveled? Oh boy. I've been all over the world. I've been from the South Pole to the North Pole, literally. I've been to the Middle East. I've toured China and Japan and Europe and man, I've, I've been everywhere. I haven't been to Australia yet and I was on my way to Cairo and um, something <laughs> happened with family matter, I didn't get there, but I've been pretty much all over the world. I've been pretty lucky, traveled a lot, yeah. Can you tell us what your tattoos mean right here? Yeah, I will. Um, so, uh, I never had any tattoos up until, I guess, about three years ago, and um, I started a nonprofit 19 years ago. Um, I mentioned before that I've been a really lucky guy and, and uh, had a big career and, and playing on TV and flying all over the world and, and um, super lucky. And uh, 19 years ago, I came across, um, I was booked to go on a tour to play for Canadian Peacekeepers. And uh, we, we were headed to um, Bosnia, it was around the time of ethnic cleansing, and we were headed to basically the North Pole to alert the northern tip of Ellesmere Island. We stopped off for fuel in a place called Goose Bay, Labrador. This was at the height of my career, and it was supposed to be a celebrity tour. <coughs> and in that community of Goose Bay, it's basically, if you were driving there from where I lived, it would take three days, and the last day would be um, a thousand kilometers or 700 miles of a gravel road, about a lane and a half wide. So basically a flying community. And at the end of that road, there's uh, the community of Goose Bay, and there's Sheshashi, an Innu community, not Inuit, but Innu. And I'd heard a little bit about what was going on in this Innu community. Uh, they were dealing with really high suicide rates and, uh, and gas sniffing, but the media hadn't really shone their lights on it yet. And so when it was my time, to, we did a concert in Goose Bay, and it was when it was my time to play, so long involved answer to your question, but I'll get there. Um, because I was feeling something for that community, I dedicated a song, played Amazing Grace and dedicated it to those kids. And I got the most uncomfortable, icy f feeling back from the audience that I've ever experienced. It just, and it wasn't because they were racist, it was none of that, it was just because it was so close to the bone, like it just was awkward. And I backed off the stage and, um, I went over by the record table and a guy came out and said, if you sneak away from your tour, I'll drive you out to that community. So I snuck out, out of the tour and I went to that community of Sheshashi, I'll condense the story. But, um, you know, as we were getting close to the town, there were piles of sand and uh, crosses in them. And he explained that they were where kids had been sniffing gas and families had burned to death. And um, it flattened me. I felt like we drove off the edge of Canada into something I'd never experienced. And we continued on, and even though I'm not a kid's entertain, entertainer, I got him to take me to the school. And uh, I went in and played for all the kids at the school and offered to give them harmonicas and, and all that. As we were leaving, um, we turned a corner, and there right in the open were eight kids with bags of gasoline to their faces. Green bag, garbage bags with gasoline in them, right to their faces, like this external lung. And he stopped the truck, <clears throat> and I, I got out and played for them. And everyone expected that they were right beside a fire, that something bad might happen, that you know they could throw gas on me, or, or um, maybe they'd tell me to screw off. They had every right to. Well, I mean, I had no right to engage them or talk to them or anything. But I did, and it didn't work out like that. They, they um, kind of broke my heart. They started to ask me about where I was from asked me if I had a family, asked me if I had kids. These are, these are these kids with bags of gas to their faces, asking about my family. Kids, and there's no kids anywhere on the planet that would do that, where I'm from, 
any big city, it wouldn't happen. And um, it made a real connection. Part of that got filmed and that footage went all around the world. So as I continued on my tour, my wife at home was getting you know, hundreds of um, offers from media outlets that wanted to talk to me about gas sniffing, and she had no idea what they were even talking about. You know, I left the big harmonica player. So when I got home, I shelved my fancy career and just tried to figure out how to connect ordinary Canadians with these kids and these communities so they could figure it out. And um, I, I said things like, well, if you have an instrument under your bed, let me know where it is and I'll go pick it up. And I filled my house full of instruments and got them into that community, a whole, whole transport truck load, and then went and did a workshop, and, and it was beautiful. It was chaos, but it was beautiful. And, um, and that put me on this path of going into other communities across Canada, loaded up with harmonicas, going out the bush at night, playing and looking for kids sniffing, handing them harmonicas. So I handed out close to 40,000 harmonicas across Canada, and started an organization called Arts Can Circle that we rotate musicians and artists through really tough communities, put in recording studios, you know, instrument lending libraries, all that stuff. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to clear a path so that communities like yours, like you guys need a louder voice, the rest of the world needs to hear what you have to say and your opinions. And, um, and I learned that way back when. And, uh, and I, I've never forgot it. And, um, I guess that's part of the reason that I'm here with Therese Captor, is uh, I just think it's so important. You guys have a powerful story to tell the world, and it needs to be heard, it really does. So, back to the details <coughs> about, um, you know, working in communities for 19 years. Uh, I started to get these pictures of people saying, hey, you're on a totem, on a totem. A carver made a, your image on a totem, like a big totem pole. I thought, yeah, right, they're going to make a, put a white guy on a totem, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And uh, I kept getting them, and sure enough, some carver put my image on a, on a totem with a big giant harmonica. And this is what they did to my, my hands and my arms on the totem. So to honor what they did uh, for me, I had that done on my hands and arms. So, so sorry, it's a long answer. I apologize for that, but that's what they did. Great story. Yeah, thanks. So. I sort of feel like poor scum sometimes. But we'll play a blues tune called Devil's Bride here. I really do appreciate the questions. It feels totally at home. It doesn't feel like a gig, like a show. And uh, it, it's really nice. I, I really appreciate it.
Um, next uh, song relates to uh, your question about the tattoos and, and my work in communities for 19 years. Doing this stuff, um, uh, I saw a lot of things that I'd never seen before that really shook me up and I had a, a reoccurring dream that was kind of more like a nightmare, I guess some people would say. And uh, it wouldn't go away and I couldn't explain it to anybody and it had music in it. And um, <clears throat> the only way um, I could make it stop was to find out, uh, figure out a way to play it. So, um, so I did that. The tune's called A Walk In My Dream and I think its purpose is when I'm back home or playing big fancy shows it puts people into a community for um, even two minutes so that when they hear about a headline on the news, it does, just doesn't go by and they forget it. So it's called The Walk in My Dream.
see yeah. every concert, uh, yeah. Muddy Waters. Lots of famous people I have. Uh -huh. What was your favorite? You're going to think this sounds cheesy, but I really mean it. Um, I've learned that my favorite concert is the one that I'm in at the moment. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I mean it. Like, how many shows can I play like this one right now in Galena, where I hear drum dancers and, and we fly into your beautiful community and it's so different than my culture and, and the lights are up in the house and we can talk back and forth, you know what I mean? Like I've learned that that's more important than like the big fancy concerts. So I have, I mean, I've played in front of, um, oh man, audiences that were probably 60,000 people in Japan and uh, like huge shows and with lots of famous people but um, this stuff makes me feel better <laughs> you know those are gigs this is different so yeah so I, I appreciate the question yeah I don't. I'm. You know what? I can barely play the harmonica, so I can't add anything to it. It's true. Yeah. Oh, you want me to do that? Okay. Yeah, you want me to do that right now, quickly? Okay. So the question was, can I play the colors of the front row of um, what it looks like? Yeah, I can do that. feels like. I'm going to start at this end. Although I could start at that end because there's two black shirts on either end. <laughs> to me, that's what it feels like in my head, believe it or not, and when I'm going by, so I'm going by the space and the two empty seats and your black shirt and the red shirt and the black shirt and two red shirts and it almost looks like a blue shirt, a gray shirt and two red shirts and a black shirt and a red shirt and a space and a red shirt and a black shirt. I know my, I'm weird, but that, that is, that's exactly what's going through my head. And it might not sound like music to everybody, but it's just, it's, all of it's going through my head all the time. So, but thanks for the question. Yeah. How does my jacket sound like? Your jacket? Yeah. All right. I do. Your jacket. Your jacket. Believe it or not, is an A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stand up again. Oh, it's got a blue top on it, but it's an A. Your jacket's more like a fiddle tune to me. Your blue hat is that. That part. Yeah. It's like taking your picture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know, I'm pretty weird. Imagine what my wife has put up with for 31 years. <laughs> Do patterns so, have colors too? Pardon me? Do patterns have colors too? They do. Patterns, well they're different. Um, patterns do have color um, and sounds. But so do, like if someone's sitting closer or farther, that, that affects it too. It's really weird, hard to explain. Some people that have this actually um, we'll see a, a color or hear a sound and it'll be a taste like chocolate or like coffee or that kind of thing. So I'm kind of glad I don't have that. <laughs> I'll do the C part solo. Step down, Jeff Coffee. Please sing. Please, please. Yeah. What's that? I'll run through the melody once in G and I'll hand it off. Thank you.
Isn't that great? Wow, what a singer. We're going to play one more for you and get out of your hair. This is, um, this is one that I got to play at the Grand Ole Opry a whole bunch over the years. And uh, this would be Hernia Warning number two. This is uh, a tune called the Orange Blossom Special. Thank you all for coming out. This is awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you. 